Hi, Stephen. Hi, hi, Mitch. Can you um, unmute yourself? There you go. There. Hi, Hello. How are you guys? Good afternoon. Good. Very good. Thank you. All right. Great. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Um, friends, um, Mitch Hedlin, she runs Recycle Across America, um, which is trying to standardize um, labeling for recycling um, across the US. And they're also um, interested in uh, doing the, something similar across, um, around the world. So you'll hear uh, more about that from her. Um, and we believe that that kind of standardization, uh, that kind of consensus um, is extremely important. So um, you'll hear more about that from her. And Stephen is a communication specialist. Uh, he's been working um, in Europe, in the UK, in Northern Cyprus, and also in Tanzania. So um, I mean, when we're talking about learning across the Atlantic, I think that kind of expertise is really important. Um, so um, Stephen, welcome. Can you tell us a little bit about your work, what you've been doing recently? Sorry, was that for, was that for me, uh, Ranjith? Yeah, Stephen. Yeah. Uh, so apologies. Uh, I, as you can hear, I, I'm, I'm not in the UK. I'm actually in Zanzibar at the moment. And despite appearances, I'm not in prison. Uh, crimes against waste communications and all that. Um, yeah, I, I'm a behavior change communication specialist working exclusively in the, the waste sector. Um, I cut my teeth principally in the UK back in 2003. Uh, the UK, UK adopted the EU landfill directive. Uh, and that set in motion a, a major transition, the way in which householders uh, set their waste out. We moved from a single bin being collected once a week uh, to multi-material multi containers. Uh, and that required a huge amount of communication, not just information, but motivation as well. Uh, and the, the communication agency I was running at the time had a special range of different uh, public facing uh, arenas, healthcare, road safety and so on. And we emerged as one of the few specialists able to transition um, communications into that behavioural change approach. Uh, and we've since gone on to work with about 140 local authorities in the UK uh, and internationally. Zanzibar is the 22nd country I've worked in, all principally post-conflict low uh, low economic regions, developing economic regions and so on. Uh, and something that, that prevails across all of those countries, whether they're, they're sort of in the G8 top of the pile or, or less so, uh, is the need that when you develop waste management systems, when waste management systems goes through reformation, you need to bring the public with you. Um, you can't force something upon the public. They need to be brought along as willing partners, as willing participants. Uh, it's an easy thing to say, a, a very difficult thing to actually deliver. Um, but there are some commonalities uh, 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 sort of in terms of what we do. Um, and it's early participation in that communication process that seems to be a common denominator that defines success. Um, Thinking about the, the, the information I, I was going to bring to today, and stop me, Ranjith, if I'm going on too long. I do have a habit of doing that. I am a communicator. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll, but, we'll, um, we'll go to Mitch, and um, we'll you know um, ask her what, about her work, and then we'll come back to you. Um, Mitch, can you tell us about um, Recycle Across America? What's the core um, reason you've started this? Um, yes, so I started uh, the nonprofit Recycle Across America and Recycle Across the World um, almost nine years ago, and I was an outsider of the industry, which I actually think was a benefit um, to actually see things in the recycling space as a consumer and as part of the public. And what I had witnessed was that um, recycling is highly dysfunctional. For the public. Uh, in the US especially, uh, every label on every bin throughout the country is usually designed, created, or decided upon based on whoever is um, in a building. So you have a school or an airport or a sports stadium or a business all uh, themselves trying to figure out how to label their bins. And 
I'm just going to share this with you. You know, this is what recycling currently looks like to the American public. And if you can look at that, you can see there is no consistency. And it doesn't look like it should even be taken very seriously. And um, so I recognized that about nine years ago. And I actually approached the recycling industry and said, here's a suggestion. Um, what if you treat recycling as we treat road safety and implement a standardized labeling system for recycling bins? Even if systems might be different from one recycling hauler or one community to the next, at least start designing a labeling system that has uh, standardized attributes and some methodology to it. Um, but at that time, you know, the U.S. was still able to sell the contaminated recycling to China, and so they weren't super motivated to fix anything. Um, and, you know, along the way, I've learned a lot about the industry and, and uh, understood why sometimes they're not super motivated to fix recycling in the U.S. So, anyway, started the nonprofit, and to date we have about 9 million standardized labels on bins throughout the U.S., and they are dramatically changing the game. Um, the public is able to recycle right when there's a standardized labeling system and when they recycle right there's no contamination or very little and therefore the cost and the efficacy of recycling dramatically improves. So I started the nonprofit Recycle Across America but also Recycle Across the World as well. Great, um, thanks much. Um, uh, so uh, next I'm going to ask you about um, uh, questions like, you know, the nonprofit model, which is, uh, I'm really interested in because we waste wise as a nonprofit and we see this as a way to invest in our collective future. Um, and so I'm going to ask you about that and also about uh, what kind of impact the China restrictions had on your operations. Um, but before that, let me, um, uh, remind everyone that uh, we have Mitch Hedlund with us and uh, Stephen Bates and my name is Ranjit Anipu. And if you have any questions, please use the live chat window before uh, below the uh, video stream and send your questions and comments to us. Um, so Stephen, um, uh, moving to you. So could you um, uh, could you tell us about um, recycling rates in Europe? Um, uh, as we were talking earlier with um, Ad, um, even though recycling rates uh, look really high, for example, 70s in certain Western European countries, a lot of it still goes to uh, poorer countries. Um, and even in those cases, the recycling rates seem to have been stagnant for a while. Um, so could you talk to us about the current situation? Yeah, definitely. But before then, Mitch, where have you been all my life? Everything you say resonates with me 100%. Um, uh, I, I will answer that, Rajiv, but I, I am also an outsider that's come into waste management, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a huge asset that we outsiders need to capitalize on. We really do. Um, Rajiv, yeah, uh, the, 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 um, the, the, the situation you've described is, is very abrupt. In the UK, we've gone in 15 years from recycling roughly 3% of domestic waste to about 43% 43 43 of domestic waste, uh, which if you looked at in isolation is a great leap. It's, 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 you know, we've come a very long way in a very short space of time. The problem is it's been around about 43% for the last couple of years. The rate has flatlined. Not only that, in some areas it's falling off. Um, the other issue that we have is rising contamination. And the contention that, that uh, uh, we're making on this is, is this not only the inconsistency of communication, but uh, quite often uh, a, a lack of communication. Uh, this in the UK is driven through austerity. Uh, the, the, the various governments, not just the current one, have made cuts into public spending, local authorities, the public sector often see communications as a cost, not an investment. Um, but the argument I'm constantly uh, making is that, that uh, unless you're recycling 70% of, of, of household waste, somebody somewhere is spending far more, far much more money than they need to disposing of waste. Uh, and the only way to address that is through communications. If you've got all your systems in place, everything's there, it's all bedded in. 
it, it's public participation that's going to make that big leap change forward, as was the case previously. Um, the external factors that are also influencing this, uh, and this applies across the whole of Europe, not just the UK, our story is about China switching off the market for plastics, um, constant press stories about everything being collected for recycling still ending up in landfill and so on. Um, so there are all these externally driven stories which are landing into the minds of the, the, the population. That's always been the case, but what's missing now um, is the seemingly unwillingness of the public sector to counter those stories to keep public interest alive. Um, and the issues about on pack recycling, I, I, I know this is the case in America, it's certainly the case in the UK, where there is actually more too much information. People net, I wrote an article recently where I said that people are willing to recycle but they just need to know if something is recyclable or not. Not it might be recyclable, it, not a question of check with your local authority, can you recycle it or can you not recycle it? People don't want to do additional research on what to do with their, with their waste. Um, if they do that, they will revert to the easiest option, which is just to throw it in the residual bin. It's a big challenge. Um, right, great. Um, thanks, Stephen. Um, uh, what you were talking about, about the press and then the public awareness right now, it reminds me of a um, situation um, a few years ago in India, where um, you know we have a city called Bangalore, which is called the Garden City of India. And um, one day, um, people around the landfill started protesting and the landfill was closed, so there was no out for all the waste that was being generated. And um, so everything was being piled up in the city um, really high. And so some citizens who were really aware, you know, you know, who had the awareness about the situation, wanted to make a change. And then they started segregating their waste because that's what all the experts told them that that would you know solve waste management challenge and they segregated the waste into two different plastic bags and then they went to the collector waste collector and then gave it to him or her and then the waste collector put both of them together in the same um truck mixing it together so uh, th there's a huge difference between uh, public awareness um, and, um, you know, press and then the infrastructure that's available for you. And um, I know, you know, you're, you're vigorously shaking your head and I know it's a similar situation even in the U.S. with um, the recycling um, uh, expectations and uh, the infrastructure that's available. Um, Mitch, do you have any comments on this? Um, any um, uh, similarities that you see um, with uh, Europe or UK? Uh, so many similarities, so much to talk about. Um, so I think the common denominator is when we're talking about recycling, the humans, the public, the consumers are the miners of the commodities that are truly valuable. Um, and there is a demand for these commodities. Unilever, perfect example. By 2025, they have made a public global statement that all of their packaging will be made with recycled commodities by 2025. Major, major commitment from a huge, what we call a CPG company, a company that makes consumer packaged goods. And a lot of these brands, global brands, are making similar commitments. So you can, you know, we can make a check off of that box. Is there demand? Yes. Is the public willing to do it? Yes. Is it confusing? Yes. Is it fixable to make it less confusing? Yes. And the infrastructure in the U.S. exists. Um, so all of the ingredients are there. You've got the demand. The technology is in place in the U.S. and many parts of Europe. Um, the infrastructure is there. The challenge is, is what Stephen has just talked about is there isn't a momentum to make it easier for the public and to communicate the necessity and in a way the, the cool factor of recycling. So it's great in theory, all the ingredients are there, but on the delivery on the communication side, it's just done in such a haphazard dysfunctional way that it never got off the ground really officially in a way where it can thrive. And those are such easy, simple fixes 
because once you get the public on board to do it properly, even just the basics, you know, for at least right now, say, let's not worry about all of the fringe type of packaging that's confusing. Let's just focus on the very basic valuable materials and make it very easy for the public to be able to recycle those valuable materials properly. They will do it. There would be much less, if maybe even zero contamination, which means the economics of it become good. And companies like Unilever and some of these other CPG companies will start to be able to act on that demand and, and actually start purchasing these materials. Um, in the US, if we didn't have such highly contaminated recyclables, most of it would never have been sent to China. Most of it would have actually been man used here. Um, you look at Europe, and European countries are very um, uh, dependent on imports. We in the US have a lot of resources just from vast mass of, pro of land um, and the resources available, but a lot of European countries have to ship a lot of their manufacturing and their products in um, because you, you might be lacking in some of those natural resources to mine from. Well, imagine if recycling is highly efficient for the public to be able to do anywhere. They're doing it right. They're collecting the best materials without contamination. The cost is, is um, efficient and viable. And manufacturers in Europe within those countries have these resources right there I think, you know, a lot of the countries, Europe and U.S. and other countries would look at that as a model where we're actually doing the circular economy right within our own country. But when the system is broken right at the public's experience at the bin, where it looks like this, and it's highly dysfunctional and they can't take it seriously, then there's a breakdown from every point after that. And then you get highly contaminated materials, you're trying to get rid of them and you're selling them to China. China finally says we've had enough of your cruddy recycling. Um, and now you have what is really seen as a collapse of US recycling in the US and globally. Right. But I think if we, if we really address the, the point A of recycling, which is the public's experience at the bin and the communication that Stephen was talking about, there's a an amazing ripple effect and autocorrect that starts to happen all the way through. Um, it's not rocket science. You know, think of all the other amazing things we do as humans, um, including getting people into, you know, to the moon or wherever, or medical uh, technology, whatever it is, this is a simple fix. Um, and, but it has to start with making it easy for the public to do wherever they are and for them to be reminded why it's so critical that they need to recycle and recycle right. And it, and it has a ripple effect even with the amount of waste going into oceans when people can start to see these materials as valuable. Right, right. Now, uh, that reminds me of a tweet that I retweeted recently, which is that materials don't fix waste, but uh, people fix it. Um, something similar. Um, but um, uh, Mitch, before we move to Stephen, a quick question. Um, has the China restrictions or the ban, um, ha has it had a positive impact in the traction that you're getting for Recycle Across America? Yeah, definitely. Um, I like to remind people or, or let them know when I have a chance to share the story that Nothing's changed since the day that I first came up with this idea. Contamination was a huge issue at that time, just as bad as it is now. Um, and the industry had an opportunity when I presented this idea for them to give it to them. They had an opportunity to prevent this crisis by adopting the standardized labeling solution in the US at that time, knowing that contamination was a huge issue. Um, but they didn't do that and they didn't do it because one they were still able to sell the recycling which was highly contaminated to china and two there is a real issue in the us and i'm becoming very outspoken um, on this subject we just i just had a new york times article about this a week and a half ago there are major conflicts of interest in the us where the most 
influential and most dominant recycling companies in the US are owned by landfill companies. So when recycling is collapsing, which is what it has been doing since the announcement of China's restriction and now ban, um, it serves those landfill companies really well. Um, so the ones holding the microphone about what's happening with recycling are the ones that are benefiting from it collapsing. It's some of the top trade associations in the U.S. represent the landfill industry and the recycling industry. Huge conflict of interest. Some of the biggest nonprofit organizations in the U.S. are funded by the landfill industry and by the virgin plastics industry. Right. Huge conflict of interest. These are, the or these are the industries that are benefiting the most from the collapse of U.S. recycling. So there's a whole bunch of underlying things that most people are not aware of. Mm -hmm. But to answer your question, now that the ban is in place and contamination is part of the daily language of recycling, now our mission is, is really flying because everybody really understands this is a huge issue and we can't let recycling just fall apart at the hands of the landfill industry. Right. Um, yeah. uh, so it's been a good thing for us. I'm just sad it took 10, it's taken nine years, you know, in a crisis. Yeah, yeah and uh, it's also um, sad or, you know, it's, a, it's an observation, just a neutral observation that nothing changed since then except for the ban. Um, and right. that's what changes everything. I think it's, a, it's probably also a learning lesson for, you know, all of us in the sector. Um, because when I joined in 2009, it just looked like nothing much was happening, but all of a sudden, uh, there's a movement on food waste, and then there's a movement on, you know, short-lived climate pollutants, you know, uh, and then there's a movement on plastic waste, and then the China ban and everything's, you know, all of a sudden changing. So um, that's really interesting. Um, Stephen, um, moving to you, um, I, I know um, if I asked you whether you think there is enough money for communications in waste management, you would say no. And um, uh, so, so let me not ask that question, but just um, ask you, you know, we, we've been doing communications um, in the U.S. and um, Europe um, in waste management for about, uh, you know, five to six decades now. Um, so, um, and of course, you know, the the amount of money that, that's been put into it is not enough. But um, what kind of, um, and, and that's generally because of austerity, you know, whenever... Um, Whenever costs have to be cut, it generally happens through, uh, you know, at, at the communications level. So I know you wanted to talk about it. Do you want to talk about it? Yeah, most, most definitely always talking about, always happy to talk about budgets for communications. Um, it's, it's a very, uh, it's, it's, it's always been an issue. Um, the conversation I've always long had with public sector clients has always started with, Steve, we have no money. That is the that is the, the starting point of every conversation I've had. Um, the, the problem is, uh, and this varies in intensity depending on where in the world you are, is that there is a, a disconnect between those within a public sector that, that understand the need for communications and those that actually sign off on the budgets for it. Uh, additional to that, where the financial benefits for recycling come in and are felt are often very much disjointed from those that are administering that. And so the, 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 ability, the inability to kind of connect the financial dots uh, makes it very difficult to justify the true amount of appropriate spending that's needed for communications. Um, I mean, for example, one project from the UK we worked on a couple of years ago, uh, this was for um, a, a, a county council and we have uh, waste collection authorities in the UK and waste disposal authorities. Waste disposal authorities tend to be the large counties, the collection authorities tend to be the small district authorities. Some do both, but I won't get into the complexities of that. Now this particular um, disposal authority, a county, worked out it was spending far more than it needed to on disposal as a result of excessive food waste going into the residual bin. Um, so they appointed us and they'd identified why this was the case. There were about 35,000 homes that were putting food waste into the residual bin when it could actually go into the, the garden waste bin. So they appointed us uh, on a project that cost them uh, about £80,000, which in dollars is about $95,000. 
hundred thousand dollars, something like that. Um, and we went and knocked on doors. We spoke to people. We provided them information, encouragement, not only to stop putting food waste in the residual bin, but also to cut the amount of food waste they were producing in the first place. The consequence of that was a 25% reduction in food waste going to landfill, which translated into an annual saving of £900,000 to the disposal authority. So £80,000 to deliver a £900,000 saving is a really good deal. Um, that, that, that's a no-brainer. When you present that to other local authorities, they'll all say, oh yeah, that's, that makes sense, we'll do that. But as soon as they try and translate that into their own particular financial mechanisms, it still comes back down to the fact that they're buying services on costs and they don't understand the, 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 the true investment potential. Um, when we look at the international market, the problem is greater because often um, terms of references are written for the provision of a communication uh, consultancy support uh, program of work. Uh, that's often quite well funded. The problem is whoever wrote the terms of reference, whoever is leading on that particular project, doesn't understand the processes of communication and, and nine times out of ten we will find that there is no budget set aside for the actual implementation. They don't recognize that the printers need to get paid to print things, web designers need the fees being paid, um, newspapers and billboard owners tend not to give away space for free. All of those things need a budget which has very rarely been accommodated. So what they end up with is, is a wonderful uh, strategic plan for communications, an implementation plan, um, explaining exactly what needs to be done in what order, but, but no money to implement it. And so that comes down to competency. There, there, there is, uh, um, it's not the right word, there is a clear lack of understanding of the, the basics of communications. I don't blame the sector for this because in a very short space of time, technically focused waste managers uh, have necessarily had to become involved in the process of communications, which is quite alien to their, their training, their, 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 their existing competencies. So I think the waste industry itself has to do more to, to improve its competency of, of, of understanding of the communication pro, uh, process so that the budgets that are allocated are appropriate and are seen as an investment, not just as a cost. Right, great. Um, since we're talking about budgets, um, Mitch, can you talk about the nonprofit model? Um, because um, you know, at Big Waste Wise, we believe that you know nonprofits are really required to invest in long-term um, mechanisms or long-term systems. And because on one hand, um, we have companies which um, work on you know quarterly. Uh, profit uh, basis and on the other hand we have governments which change every few years um, therefore their priorities are also you know accordingly short term um, so so we believe you know the nonprofit model is really important but can you talk about how you went with that model and you know how you get it financed because we also believe nonprofits have to be financed to be able to create the change that they want to yeah absolutely so that was a decision that I made right from the beginning is that it really has to be a nonprofit. Um, otherwise, if we're a for profit company, people would say, well, what makes that the standardized labels? You're just a label company and you're just selling labels. Um, so we wanted to make sure that it wasn't a for profit um, so that it was truly out to serve the greater good. Um, in the beginning when I first started this, I actually made it where all of the label artwork um, was available for people to download and print off themselves. So when I first started this and the recycling industry didn't take it, I told my husband, I swear this is going to be really fast. I'll be right back to my profession and I'll make everything downloadable on the website. People can just print it off and, and run with it. Um, but in a very short amount of time, we saw that people were opening up the PDFs of, or the files of the label artwork and starting to change some of the components and putting in branded product images. And, and so that was one red flag. 
Um, the other is that on a news program shortly after I started, I had seen that some groups had printed off um, the standardized labels just on a sheet of eight and a half by 11 paper, black and white, and then just taped it to a bin. Um, so I had a discussion with our board of directors saying, what should we do? Because if everybody is just doing this and it's still haphazard, is it going to work? And so we made a decision to start producing the labels, um, very, very high quality, but at just a fraction of what people would be um, buying another label for. So, you know, here's one example of, of a paper label for recycling paper. And so we made them very high quality, but this is a dollar or a dollar um, 70 compared to another label that you've got online that just is black and white that's maybe three dollars each. So even though we're nonprofit, we actually have something that we're selling, quote unquote, but we're selling it to protect the quality of the label initiative, the solution itself, and we're selling them at just a fraction of what it costs to make it, or a little bit more than that, I should say. So we have very small margin and that's how we fund ourselves, which has been a benefit also because that means we're not spending our time going out looking for funding. Um, and we're also not compromising our mission. There are a lot of nonprofits um, in this space that are taking money from the virgin plastics industry or the virgin commodity industry or the landfill industry. And, um, you know, I think for us, our model, we we're very um, frugal and it doesn't take much for us to operate, but the fact that we can be self-sufficient is a good thing. And the other thing I wanna mention, and I don't know if this is true for Europe, but um, we are just about to announce next week that we have the largest, uh, what's called a PSA campaign in the US. It's, that stands for Public Service Announcement um, Campaign in US history excuse me, for recycling and to help people understand why recycling right is important. Um, and because we're a nonprofit, we will have, I mean, right now we have about $12 million worth of um, free PSA ads in print, TV commercials, and billboards. Um, and it's the biggest campaign ever. And all of that is free because we are a nonprofit. Um, and we have about 40 different celebrities now on board with our PSA campaign, but also mayors, um, lieutenant governors, secretaries of state, athletes, musicians, um, an Olympian that are all joining in and giving and donating their time to be part of this campaign. So, you know, I think the decision to be a nonprofit is critical um, to advance this mission and it's served us well because um, a lot of these media groups see that we do have a solution that's going to help fix recycling and they're willing to give up uh, space to communicate it. Um, but I don't know if that's true in Europe or not or other countries. Um, if advertising companies make space available for nonprofits to help advance a mission, but if they do, you know, it, it ends up being really beneficial. Um, um, Stephen, do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think the, the, the role that not, uh, non-profits have to play in the whole movement towards sustainability is vital. Um, Europe, UK is slightly different in that we have, or used to have, a very effective uh, non-government organisation called RAP, Re Waste Resources Action Programme, um, that, that developed uh, the, the Recycle Now and Partners program, which did ostensibly exactly what, what you were doing, Mitch, at the bequest. They were a non profit, non government organization um, that owned the national, developed and owned the national Recycle Now branding and so on, uh, and made available a, a suite of, of resources that, that local authorities could utilize at no cost. 
Uh, and there are, of course, uh, various uh, local and regional um, sort of charities and not-for-profits that are very active in the sector. Uh, what's interesting is the role that uh, non-profits make in the international development sector. Uh, and to give you one example of a project we were involved in in North Cyprus. Now, I use the word north or northern Cyprus advisedly. Uh, uh, according to the international community, there is no such place as North Cyprus, it's just Cyprus. Um, but I'll assume you'll understand the, the kind of the delicate political um, sort of uh, politics that prevail in that region. But in the northern part, uh, they have one landfill site, which is already full, it's long been full. Uh, they're, they're dumping waste to the side of that whilst they're waiting for another one to be open. Uh, there's a huge EU program running in the north which is uh, sort of a, a reunification kind of program which is helping the, the two sides come closer together um the irony of a british company working on an eu funded reunification project is not lost on me at the moment um but one of the issues that we're having there is trying to sort of divert as much waste from landfill as we can in an area where there is no recycling there is no official recycling other than the informal sector so what we had to do was to look at what routes are available um, to divert waste. You know, we, we can we can appeal to people's better nature to reduce the waste, which you know, we are doing as well. But we looked at, at three primary waste streams: uh, food waste, textiles, and cans. Now, I'll give you the example of textiles. We found that there were was in in Nicosia a charity that collected uh, donated clothes. Um, uh, which it then sold at markets to raise money to provide um, support for cancer sufferers uh, in the north, many of whom can't access treatment in Turkey, cannot afford to, to go to other parts of Europe for treatment and so on. And so we approached them and said, well, look, if you know, we've got some money here from the EU, would you like us to test whether or not some kind of campaigning will, would improve the amount of textiles that you receive? Uh, of course they said yes and we launched this campaign um, and it was profoundly successful with support from the charity them, themselves uh, we saw a fourfold increase in the amount of textiles donated to this particular charity that is increased even further um, they have received donations of goods not just uh, clothes but electrical items that still work um, they, they have been able therefore to expand their footprint across the region, they've opened up stores. It has completely transformed that organization uh, to a point where the number of people that are benefiting from the work that they're doing uh, has increased dramatically. At the same time as reducing uh, a very key uh, and significant waste stream going to landfill, we're actually finding a different use for it. We did a similar thing with a charity that collects cans, uh, raises money uh, through the sale of cans, beverage uh, cans and so on for children's hospitals. Um, and an animal rescue charity that accepts food waste uh, that it uses as food uh, for feed for the animals that it cares for. And that's a really, really good example of um, sort of institutional support being given to not-for-profits. Uh, to benefit not just what they're doing, but also divert waste away from landfill. And such has been the, the, the impact that, that has had locally. Awareness of the whole recycling issue across the population there has increased drastically as well. So I think not-for-profits play an important part, particularly when you come to places like here in Zanzibar, uh, we're working with uh, several not-for-profit organizations. Um, that you know, these are the guys that are actually really doing things. They're, they're getting grubby, they're getting dirty, they're down with the communities. Um, commercial organizations can't do that. Great. Um, um, thanks, Stephen. So um, I wanted to ask you really quickly, so did the China restrictions, did they have any impact on uh, communications budgets in waste management in, in, in the UK or in Europe? Um, not in the. I wouldn't say they've had an impact in terms of the communication budgets. Um, the, the, the subject comes up in the media quite often. My my belief, and I have no evidence to support this, um, that the three reasons why local authorities are not spending on communications. 
One is austerity. They, they simply don't have the freedom to spend as they did before. Um, that isn't the primary reason because we have proven that that can be overcome. One is that we are awaiting a new waste strategy. Um, that's imminently due for, for publication and I think that there, there's lots of rumours about what that may contain. So I think that there is um, a, a bit of a waiting game playing. Um, but I suspect uh, that the biggest influence in the UK in terms of spending is, is dear old Brexit. Um, because none of us know what the hell is happening, <laughs> to be perfectly frank. We don't know what the future is going to hold for the public sector uh, beyond March, and the public sector is really going to feel the brunt of that, either in the most positive way possible or the most negative way possible. Right. But because we have no way of knowing that, we so can't move forward. So you would say that at this point um, th there isn't um, any clear impact on, you know, the spending because of the China restrictions. Yeah. All right. At, at the moment, the, the general sense is that, that the world is going to end on the 31st of March, oh, 2019. That happens every year. Um, so I know very well about that. But um, Mitch, so um, coming back to you, um, uh, this is a question uh, which is much more operational, um, uh, which is, you know, so uh, you're trying to standardize this kind of, um, you know, labeling system across the U.S. And we've been talking about national level coordination um, that is lacking in the U.S. when it comes to various things in, in the waste management sector. And um, I mean, when I came across Recycle Across America, I was thinking, wow, this is, you know, such a uh, this has such a huge potential to be one of those national level standards or, you know, consensus um, between uh, all cities. Um, among all cities. And um, so I, I was trying to understand how does the labeling system work with different systems? You know, all cities don't have the same systems. Um, you know, some, some are single stream, some are dual stream. So could you talk to us about that a little bit? And um, before you start that, let me remind everyone that we are in the last seven minutes of this um, conversation with Mitch and um, Stephen. So, um, and after this, uh, after Mitch, I'll ask both of them to conclude with any concluding remarks. So, um, you know, Mitch, go for it. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that question comes up. And when I first started this, I didn't realize how complex recycling is from one community to the next. So it's not a one-size-fits-all standardized labeling system. Um, the standardized labels work for every type of sorting system. We've created the label for every system that a community might have. Um, so if there's a, a community where paper needs to be separate, there's a label that's just for paper. In communities where they have mixed recycling, then there's a standardized label for mixed recycling. And they come in different configurations as far as fitting on different bins. Um, you know, I use often the analogy of standardized stop signs and speed limit signs. Um, all of us here in the U.S. go through driver's training when we're about 15 or 16 years old. And in that training, we learn uh, standardized speed limit signs. We learn signs for railroad crossing and school crossing and sidewalk uh, crossings. Um, we learn probably hundreds, if not thousands, of different indicators and of how to drive properly. And then we're able to get in our car at 16, and for the rest of our lives, we're able to drive anywhere in the U.S. and sometimes in other countries, seeing the exact same standardized labeling for all of that. Um, I like to use speed limit signs because on one street we might be going 15 miles per hour and we turn left and go on to another street that's 35 miles an hour and we go on to another street that's 65 miles an hour and instinctively we know what to do because the way that the information is presented is standardized. So even though recycling systems might be different from one community to the next or one recycling company to the next, um, the way that the information is conveyed with certain co color methodology, language methodology, and photos allows the public to be able to recycle right. So just to give you an example, um, just one school district, I like using this because it has financial metrics also, but one school district in Orlando, Florida, 
implemented the standardized labels. And within the first year, the recycling levels went up 90%. Um, and the school district saved $370,000 in trash hauling fees in one year because their recycling program changed so much with the standardized labels. Um, we're seeing this type of result over and over and over again. So you can kind of imagine what happens when you scale up throughout the country where it becomes a default for people to be able to recycle right wherever they are, regardless of what that recycling program is designed to be. Um, as long as there's that standardized labeling system, people can react to that almost more like a reflex and take it seriously. People don't take recycling, even though they love it, they can't take it uh, seriously because it's presented in such a dysfunctional way throughout the US. Um, so it's really a rebranding of recycling on a national level. And I think the opportunity is there on a global level. Um, I ended up winning a book of fellowship because they saw the potential that this could be replicated across the world easily. Um, so uh, it's, it's just that simple. <laughs> No, uh, I, I mean, when you hear about it, it just seems so simple. And, you know, I think that that's the case with most communication um, um, interventions where you're thinking this could be done so simply. It's not rocket science, like you mentioned earlier. Uh, but uh, thanks for that, Mitch. So, um, Stephen, um, and before I go to Stephen for his closing remarks, um, uh, Mitch, how many um, communities are you working with right now? And congratulations on the largest PSA and on saving so much money for Orlando. Yeah, thank you. Um, so right now we have over a little over 9 million standardized labels in use across the US. And um, it, there's about, just to give you an example, probably just under a million standardized labels in use in businesses in New York City. They did an announcement on their uh, sanitation website last summer when they mandated recycling. So that is about a million standardized labels just in New York City alone. Um, we have our first state, Rhode Island, is the first state that's rolling out the labels throughout the whole state. Um, Orlando, the city of Orlando is rolling it out throughout the whole city of Orlando. In Florida, Phoenix and Arizona, we have counties coming on board in California. So it's really mushrooming right now. Um, but unfortunately, it took this crisis for that to happen, um, which is a shame because at the same time that we're growing fast, a lot of people are hearing that their recycling is going to a landfill. Right. So we have to go farther faster because we don't, we can't lose the trust of the public with recycling. And they're starting to lose faith in recycling and think it's a hoax when they hear in the news that the recycling is going to a landfill. Right, right. Uh, um, Makes sense. No, uh, thanks so much for that, Mitch. Um, Stephen, um, do you have any um, remarks or comments that we haven't um, uh, covered in this discussion? Any key messages? Uh, no, I mean, uh, uh, Mitch and I share many common visions and, and observations as to, to the solution to the, to the issue. Um, I, I thought I would demonstrate how simple it could be to solve the problem by showing you my lunch. <laughs> right now, I'm fairly certain that this tube of Pringles, uh, other crisps are available that I purchased from a market here in Zanzibar, looks exactly the same as a tube of Pringles that you might buy in the US, that you might buy in the UK, France, Germany, Australia, or anywhere else that Pringles are sold. Uh, that logo is exactly the same, the, the, the whole packaging design is the same. Um, so we've got a commercial company there able to create something visual which is standard the world over. Um, why can't we do that for a recycling symbol? You know, why, why can't we standardize that, that kind of approach? Um, the, the reason actually is institutional. The reason that Pringles can do that regardless of where in the world they're, they're sold, and that's not just my lunch, by the way, it's just a snack, um, is the fact that they, um, they have probably a marketing director that has said that is how it's going to be. Um, the waste sector is, is necessarily um, highly diverse, but there needs to be, it needs to come together on this issue. There needs to be a new global packaging covenant. Uh, it needs to be mobilized from within 
the waste sector from not-for-profits such as Mitch, from, from communication specialists such as myself, perhaps there are others available, so that there is recognition of, of, of the need and the ability easily to, to implement something. Um, I, I thought recently doing a presentation that we actually already have a global recycling symbol, it's the Mobius loop, the three triangles. You know, why are we trying to reinvent the wheel? Why not sort of make the wheel that we've already got fit for purpose? And uh, I, I think that's uh, that's really what I, I will take the time up to say. All right, all right, great. Thanks so much, Stephen. Um, so uh, thanks, Mitch and Stephen, for uh, joining us today. So um, I'll um, uh, I'll hide you from the broadcast, and then um, we'll bring Emma Berlo from um, Read the Resource Futures and um, Kate Bailey from EcoCycle. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks, guys.